Lord God, we come to you this evening, God, asking that you lead us and guide us, Lord God, through this process, Lord, which you've given unto us, God, in this advancing education. And God, we ask that you would keep us humble, Lord God, as little children, Lord, youth, that, Lord, we may learn, that we may be able to help the next generation, God. And God, we just thank you for this time and this opportunity, and ask that you would bless and anoint and move through Pastor Brand tonight as he facilitates this, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are held accountable for how we minister or don't minister to the brethren, especially those young in Christ, those tender. Luke 12 and 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Matthew 25, 34 through 45. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came into thee? And the king shall answer unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hunger, ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, ye took me not in. Naked, ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye did it not unto the least of these, you did it not to me. Proverbs 27, 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flock, and look well to the herds, to thy herds. Matthew ten forty two. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Matthew nineteen thirteen through 15. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Matthew 18, 1 through 6, and verse 10. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as, a little, as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were, it were better for him that a milestone were hung about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. 
For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Sobering, isn't it? We need to understand the importance Christ put on ministering to those young in the faith. If there is no sincere, spiritually led desire to feed God's people, I could, I could come up with a list of things that would go wrong. <laughs> but let me put it in the positive. If we do have a desire to teach God's people, young, old, I don't care whether I think that they're worthy of my time or not. The Bible said to condescend the men of low estate. It doesn't matter. We need to minister. We are held accountable to minister. And let me take this point a little bit further. We talked about it at our conference last year in John chapter 4. When Jesus was speaking with the woman at the Samaritan well, the Samaritan woman at the well there. And we all familiar with the quote we share it many times, you know, look upon the fields for they're white or ready to harvest, right? Which fields was he pointing out to his disciples? Let's just think about it for a second. Turn your Bibles, go to it, John chapter 4. Take a look at it. You're going to find that those fields that he was admonishing his disciples over to look upon were those that they despised, those of Samaria. And those were going to be the people that would be what he had the laborers. Look upon these fields. They are white to harvest. They are ready to harvest. You're not even looking at them. You have prejudice in your heart. You have tradition that's blocking the ways of God. And yet those little ones have angels that give account in the face of God. Working with new believers. Now, I'm not taking away anything from working with each other. Working amongst your, your, your friends. But when we come to, to worship, to fellowship, to, to gatherings in Jesus' name, who do you suppose, based on those scriptures we just got done reading and praying over, who do you think should be the ones that we're going to spend the most time with and attention? That's a rhetorical question. You don't need to answer that. <laughs> Our mission statement is to evangelize, educate, equip, right? Provide spiritual support and Christian fellowship worldwide. Part of how we are doing this is educate, right? That's a pretty big piece of that. Equip. I will do my best to present to you tonight a vision that I believe with all my heart, with all my being, all my prayers and fastings, that this is something God has put forward for us to embrace and live. I don't know how else to set that up. Right now, I'm only going to talk about working with new believers. There's another section of this that we're going to get into after the break. Yeah, you're going to get a break. A um, couple of them, actually. Where we're going to talk about mentoring and in, in that process, by the time we get there, you're going to understand it and, and what we're talking about. So that's, we are going to equip you with education tools. So how cool is that? This workshop is designed for new believers in Christ, age 10 and up. If you are below age 10, that doesn't exempt you. Matter of fact, that just means that those older than you should pull you aside and share with you and tell you even more. Mentors of new believers. Yes, it's for mentors of new believers. Let me just, at the start of this, before I even get too much further, how many of you have a mentor? that you communicate with, held accountable to, and you grow because you have a mentor. How many of you have a mentor? Okay. I'm not trying to shame anybody. Please hear my heart. I'm not. I'm trying to wake us up. How many of you mentor someone else? 
How many of you have people that give account to you that you work with and that, okay, now let me just say this part before I get going. Mentors and new believers, ministry leaders, every person in this room should have a mentor and be mentoring. That's the vision I want to put forth tonight. And if you're looking to be effective in ministry, this is for you. This will be on our website, the, the, the one I had up here before. It'll be on there as lesson plans, like we have the one seminar that we converted to lesson, that the app to teach. It's in the Sharing the Faiths. We made a, a mini course out of that. Okay, we're going to be establishing a legacy. Are you following along with me? Remember the one that had the globe in the front? You see the slide number? It's bottom right corner, right? It says number four. I bet if you go to this, this page right here, and it says slide number four, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Everybody with me? Can we get started? Amen. We need to establish legacy. Oh, we probably heard that word before. But we need an organized effort to do it. It's not just an individual process. It is a, a group process to be the most effective. So we are going to do this in an organized fashion. We are going to do this with a cycle in this ministry, with the mission, and we will establish a sustainable and effective way to grow our ministry. And you know how we're going to do it? We're going to grow ministry-minded people. Years into the future if Jesus tarries, but I don't think he will, saints. So we understand the Christian Fellowship mission we just got done talking about. So we need to establish something that's going to keep that wheel turning. Evangelize, educate, equip. We need something to keep, we need a motor to keep that wheel turning. And you know, sometimes that motor has to come in the form of conviction in our hearts. The motor is the Holy Ghost. It's not a system, it's not a program, it's not people. It's the Holy Ghost in your heart. Submission and obedience to conviction. So we're going to establish a system of spiritual support. That's part of our mission. And we're going to do this. It's going to be part of the philosophy and how we put this together. And we're going to support through mentoring. Mentoring is part of the engine, the motor, that's going to keep this baby going until Jesus comes. Multiple methods of training. In the military, you have multiple levels of training, different types of training. You have on-the-job training. You have the school training, right? You go to A school, go to the fleet. They tell you to forget everything you learned in A school, right? <laughs> tell you to do it their way, the right way, the wrong way, and the Navy way, right? Okay. Well, we're going to do it the Holy Ghost way in the spiritual, scriptural ways. Let's talk about the logistics of our legacy. Well, let's use the example of the scriptures, the Bible. They, the scriptures have given us an example of the mentoring process. They didn't call it mentoring. I, I don't know what really they really called it, except this was such a way of life to them. They didn't have to put a label on it. So they, the training logistics of the biblical time was through the Holy Ghost. Jesus said he would bring all things back to our remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. So there, there also shows a simple form of teaching, accountability, right? Communication, that things that we look at that are core to mentoring. Their scriptures are packed full of it, but it comes through the Holy Ghost. Old Testament parchments, you know, they obviously shared that amongst each other all the time. That was part of their biblical trainings. They, Jesus gave us the example of how he used to read the scriptures. What was it? When he was 12 years old, right, in Jerusalem, he read from the book of Isaiah. Letters to the churches, okay, by, and the letters to the churches we have throughout the New Testament, Acts of the Apostles, and how they caused the letters from one church to be read into another. That is a form of mentoring, if we want to label that, okay? It was a continual support. The traveling evangelists and representatives of Jerusalem, Antioch, that traveled throughout the regions. Remember when they had that issue in Acts chapter 15 where they talked about the circumcision and, and things of this nature? 
they mentored and they taught through traveling evangelists and representatives as well. The apostles at Jerusalem were there. They were the bedrock. It was the most persecuted. Some of the apostles were called by God to move on because of the persecution. And God used it mightily. Now, in the latter times, obviously latter compared to biblical times, let's talk a little bit about what we had when I was growing up. Yes, I'm a fossil. I know I'm old. For those of you that are very young, could you even imagine a time when we didn't have these things? We did not have personal computers. No, we did not have cell phones. We did not have internet. We used manual typewriters. Carbon copy actually meant something. Uh, copper wire phones, landlines, paper Bibles only, paper concordances only, and we survived. Okay, so now let's, uh, now let's take a look at how we should really do it, because what really was the method used? It was the Holy Ghost. It was using the scriptures that they had available to them, the parchments, the letters. They shared once with another through the evangelism. It was a way of life. It was a way of eternal life. They were spiritually minded. They were in one mind, one spirit, one accord. Holy Spirit communications. How Paul talked about being present with you, absent in body, but present with you through the spirit. Oh yeah, there's some gifts there. Consistent, regular Bible studies and study schedules. Daily devotions and prayers. Accountability and fellowship and communication. That's what we cut our teeth on, those of us that are ancient. <laughs> what made the ministry successful when we first started? It was all spiritual tools. Okay, old school and biblical training now. Again, I'm going to use the P word, philosophy. Uh, in the old types, in school, it was literal. You had brick and mortar schools, trainings. Students trained on location. You were known as the disciple by who your master was, who your trainer, your mentor was. The scripture that comes to my mind where it talks about Paul, then called Saul, being brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. His level was not of status. His level was measured by his mentor, not by him. That's how seriously they took this relationship. Brought up at the feet of, okay, call it, call it a mentor. Okay, now we have digital schools today, right? How many of you have ever taken classes online? I'm not talking about our cast, but I mean classes online from other colleges and, and things, all offered online through that wonderful internet. So now students train with the methods of teaching, and quite frankly, the methods of teaching are being adapted. But the spiritual content and the purpose has never changed. The doctrine's the same, but the ways of teaching it are changed or varied let's put it that way so what do we have today we have our way of life that is equipped with don't let that methodology scare you it just just think of that as being uh, ology means study of methods how we disseminate the, the the studies right how we understand the sound doctrine Okay, today we have it through internet, through websites. We have our church, our main church website, which is mychristianfellowship.org. We have our training arm of it, which is cfcmiae.org, and they're linked together, so you could go back and forth by clicking on the logos or, or appropriate links. We have videos that have been made, edited. We have audio of those videos. We have smart and mobile devices that are uh, ready to go. We have all of our classes that you can download into uh, interactive PDFs. Don't even need the internet after that. We have podcasts. We have all kinds of things. Uh, desktop, laptop, computers. And now we're getting to the point where the tablets are becoming, uh, overtaking the laptop as well as the desktop. It's a fast move. Fellowship, support worldwide via... How do we provide our mission statement of our church? Well, there's different ways. It used to be you just lined up to the phone booth. <laughs> and you went to the phone booth. How many of you even know what a phone booth is anymore? So we have text. We have Skype. We have instant messaging, Facebook, uh, many other digital means that I never got into. That Satan's all over. You can count on it. 
We are going to build ministry. We are going to build the kingdom of God in every aspect of it by growing and investing into each other. And it starts with a new believer. We are going to have, and we do have, clearly defined learning paths of personal growth within our ministry. Ah, you may say, I haven't seen it. Well, okay. It takes time. You've got to put it up on the internet. You've got to get your lessons together, all that happy things, right? We are doing that right now. A learning path, by definition, is basically, let me just put it in layman's terms, it's a predefined order of lessons. It's a predefined order. Lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, lesson four. And you know what? The elders of our ministry, we have gotten together, fasted, prayed, and we decided, yep, that would make sense. A logical order from that topic to that topic to that topic to that topic to that end. That's a learning path. So we have these set up for your growth as an individual. And again, please let me just strike the mantra again. We're just trying to take biblical principles that were a way of life, of training, constantly training. But it wasn't just the training fact of it. It was the building of the soul. It was the edification in love. It was the growth of the body of Christ. Yeah. And mentoring, we're going to get into later. But leaders investing in ministry by investing in its people. How many times have you ever had the devil tell you, wow, what are you getting out of this ministry? To which I boldly would return and say, what are you putting into this ministry? You reap what you sow. So we invest. Supercharged. Hemi. A cycle of ministry growth by mentoring. Did you ever, like me, did you ever just marvel when Jesus said, greater things shall you do because I go unto the Father? Did you ever just think about that and say, I can't do any better than Jesus? Come on. Right? Why did he say that? He said that because the Holy Ghost would come back. He gave us a comforter. He gave us this powerful teaching tool. Oh, man, it's tasty. So good. What's our target audience? Now I'm getting into the methodology. Remember I used that big word before? When we write our trainings, this clear path that everyone should be able to see, so you know along the line of the path where you're at basically, uh, sort of like at an airport or at a rest stop, you are here. You have that much more to go. (laughs) Encouraging somewhat, but okay, at least I know I have a clear path. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to put up our curriculum, and we're going to write it so that we can use it for the broadest spectrum as possible. We're going to write it so that it's at the basic fifth grade level. And you know what? I don't care if you're a college student. You can understand fifth grade level teaching. And we have it also tailored curriculum delivery. There's mentor guidance, situational mentoring, uh, all kinds of good things that will make sense later in this seminar, but I put it there anyway, so there. Ministry leaders, we're talking about methodology, how we're going to train, the way of life, understanding. Ministry leaders have to what? Understand the advancing education system and process. Ministry leaders, to be effective, have to understand what the new person, the new Christian, what they're not only what they're going through, but how they're going to learn and what they're going to learn. They have to understand that. So it's a process. It's a way of life. Resources and options. How can I suggest something to you to equip you so that you can educate yourself or help you educate if, if I don't understand what the resources and options are? Also, ministry leaders need to keep in mind the future of the ministry. Looking for future leaders of leaders. Look upon them fields. How many of us that are elders in the ministry now were complete outcasts before when we first came to Christ? Despised. Just 
Everyone thought, yep, that person's nothing. Will be nothing, always be nothing. So future leaders, by the way, do come from the nothings. Mentor guidance based in example and testimony. But that's not the only way to guide. But I'll tell you what, if you're really living it and you're walking it, when you start to talk it, it'll, it'll mean something. Adapting curriculum and methodology precedents. Uh, I'm sorry, I got a little technical there. We have to be able to adapt all of our teachings in various ways and methods because our precedence is in the individual person that we're working with. I'm not going to try to make any new person, I'm not going to try to make any person fit my mold, come to my box. I'm going to take the box to them. Matter of fact, forget the box. <laughs> forget the box. 16. Learning management. Okay, you got to have a system, right? Well, God gave us a system. He gave us teachers, right? Gave gifts unto men. Gave the gift of teaching. Four, the perfecting of the saints, work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come, right, into the stature of the fullness. Perfect. So there is a management system that God has. We're going to tap into it as best as we can. There's a progression. Student, disciple. The student tutor, the on-the-job training. Think of it as A school going to uh, the fleet or different levels of C school, what have you. Student tutor, on-the-job training, mentor, student in higher advancing education. This is a person that's learning and mentoring. Elder, this is a person that is, a uh, yes, a mentor, mentor of mentors. This is a person that is teaching people to teach, that teach people to teach. <laughs> Amen. And this is what really makes this work. Part of our learning management system is an oversight team. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, although I could probably say this is technically slide 18, but okay, forgive me. A training oversight team is composed of ministry elders that oversee, and this is what they oversee, the training status of each person, each student, the training status of each mentor in training, and the effectiveness in their workload of each ministry mentor. Once a month, I write a report. It goes to the elders of the ministry. And you know what? Every person that I have input on through mentors that coordinate, we have a system for this communication. Once a month, the elders know where you are in your training. They know where the mentors are that are training you. They know who they are mentoring. They know how many they are mentoring and if they're being effective because they give account by how many lessons or how effective their students are. <laughs> so there's accountability here. You may not have known this, but it comes up in, in two major segments when we give a status of the, of the disciples of the student, those advancing and those not advancing. That's how we block it. Once a month. Many people are on the list of not advancing and many people are on the list of advancing. Yeah, we give account. There's an oversight. I think one of the scripture verses talked about giving well, tending well to the flock, and to be diligent. So there's a training oversight team for the purpose of spiritual synergy, oversight of training, accountability, personal growth, and to help develop what that clear path looks like, not only as in ministry, but also for individuals that grow in talents, gifts, and, and purpose in Christ. Is this worthy of your time tonight? Is it good? Thank you. I'd like to hear that. It's encouraging. So the oversight team is made up of the ministry elders, and uh, we make changes and adapt to the student's learning path as needed, changes to a student's mentor if needed. Sometimes you can have more than one mentor, depending on how you're advancing in ministry. Students' availability, there's a review, there's adaptations made. Personal growth. Slide 20. Training oversight team. Personal growth, students progressional. So this is very important. There are milestones that we try to set up 
Uh, this is forecasted through the elders. We try to, uh, most everybody goes to boot camp, right? I mean, in the military analogy, it doesn't matter what your rate is. If you're enlisted, you're going to boot camp. If you're an officer, you're going to uh, officer training. So, but then it starts to diversify from that, right? Based upon, well, your contract, what you signed up for in the military anyway. Hopefully, it's according to the aptitude that you showed on your tests and, and things of this nature. In the ministry, we want it to be the same way. We want to see spiritual gifts. We want to see different callings. Some people are born with spiritual gifts. They, they just have natural abilities. Some people can, example, they can just talk to people, invite them out to church, and there's just, boy, they come in by the droves. That's a beautiful gift. I would be negligent had I not notified an elder that there's somebody that had that kind of gift and we need to tailor and adapt training for that person or whatever their gift may be. Some people have gifts of ministry, of uh, uh, music or hospitality. or There's so many things I, I, I'm afraid to start mentioning. So there's adaptation. Training methodologies. Let's go to there. That's number 23 in your book. Methodology or the study of the methods or how we're going to adapt and make it to each individual person. So there's training curriculum is taught in various methods. Paper will never go away. I don't care how paperless an office is, there's always paper. Computers, desktop, laptops, iPads, whatever. Digital copy. Just think of it as in a newspaper, whenever they were putting together a story, they called it the copy. We call it digital copy because it is everything in the curriculum in digital format. Hybrids, adaptable, any of the above, mix the above. So we want to take our training methods and adapt them to you as an individual person. I want to train you to be better mentors. I want to train you to do the very best you can personally. I am going to grow ministry by growing you as a believer. This is just here for the sake of, uh, so you can see that we're, what we're talking about is real. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 12. Uh, actually 10, let's just stay at 10. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through, okay, speak up, the knowledge of God. Okay, how do I get that knowledge, right? I got to be taught. And of Jesus our Lord. So you got to have conviction. You got to have conscience that's submitted to the Holy Spirit. You got to be Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge. Okay. He wants to give us life and godliness and all things that pertain to it. But you know, we get it through the knowledge. You got to know your Bible. Well, it's more than just quoting scripture, it's living it with Jesus as your Lord. Whereby. Whoop, I skipped, didn't I? Through the knowledge unto him that has called us unto glory and virtue. Glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these, and he's talking about the covenants, by the way, when he says the promises. He's talking about the covenant of God. God saying, if you will keep me in your heart, if you will have me be your Lord, I will be your God. I will give you this, if then promises. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving some diligence. Oh, you're right. All diligence add to your faith virtue. Don't just quote it. Don't just wear a cross. Live it. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, that self-control. I don't know how to control myself. I don't know how to escape the world through lust. I don't know any of that if I don't have the knowledge of the word of God. So I get temperance. I get self-control. And then temperance, patience. Yeah, I can have patience. Patience. Now, because I understand self-control and I know that I don't have to go through all these things, I can escape. I have patience. And from the very start of a, of a trial, I know that I have the victory. 
because I've proved it. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Wow, the greatest thing out of all that, charity. For if these things be in you and have some of it, oh, abound. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you ever feel like you could not measure up? Do you ever feel like I don't know why God even bothers with me? Do you ever feel like that? I do. Yeah. You shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. It's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, not just those Joes outside of the church, brethren, give diligence to do what? To make your calling and election sure. So if you ever had times where you wondered if you were saved or not anymore, you really wondered, God, I don't know if I'm actually going to make it to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it through this battle or that battle. Boy, this is a big one. I, <laughs> I just don't know. I don't know. I will not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge. I, I do know I can overcome. I do know I can go through all this. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never... Never, never fall. For so an entrance. You know how big that word is, entrance. It's not an exit. Take it out of your realm. It's an entrance into the Holy Spirit. It's an entrance into the spiritual realm of beautiful, wonderful deliverance. Not just escape, but joy and power in the Holy Ghost, glory and virtue. An entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. Not a cracky get to crawl through. Into what? The everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's right now while we're alive. The everlasting kingdom is within you. You can have it now. I got to move on. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the course. Okay, I'm, before I shift gears and go into the course... Is there anybody who has any questions of the mindset, what I'm trying to paint here? It, it's a way of life. It's not a program. It's not just something that we think this will be good and whoever's in charge puts in their own program. This should be our way of life. Now, Rod, you were chief in the Navy. Um, is mentoring a part of the Navy? Is it part of the culture? Very much so, because there's a reason it's part of the culture, because it works. Okay, so everywhere we go, every person we, we, we come in contact with, we should be sharing and ministering the kingdom of God with them. How are we going to do this? Remember we talked about the clear path? Well, it starts with a new believer, right? That's the cycle. It starts there. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're, they're saved, okay? In John chapter 1, uh, I, I forget what verse it is. I think it's 12. Where it says, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Right? To who? The ones that would believe on his name. So we can take this, and if you are working with a new believer, that's a tender, tender plant. Trust me, the devil's after that plant. For it even, this parable of the seed sower in action. So we had to start somewhere. So the foundation cornerstone if you want to look at the, the reason we use the words, Christ is our cornerstone, right? He, he is the, the foundation. But we're also on the foundation of the apostles, and that's the building blocks, which is the next course, foundation building blocks. But the first course is foundation cornerstone. It's designed and overseen by ministry elders. And I should have put in adapted, right, modified, as needed, designed by and overseen by ministry elders. There is a consistency in the writing, and I'm going to pause here for just a second. One of the sheets that we had on the front table there was uh, uh, this one, uh, but I, if I run out, we'll have it available online. 
it became very clear to me early on, many years ago, when we started writing this course, when I started asking for input from many, many different people to give me their Bible studies, their scriptures, their thoughts, their teachings on various subjects that are now in the Cornerstone course, that uh, there was a lot of different writing styles. <laughs> and they all looked different. Matter of fact, some of them were kind of hard to follow. But that didn't make them wrong. But if we're going to do this from the eyes and the perspective of the new believer, then we need to make it as easy as possible for them to study. We should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. We should take away at every opportunity Satan's opportunities to distract, to cause confusion. So we came up with this consistency in curriculum policy, and I'm not going to go over this in detail. I'm not. It's here if you're interested. You can get it. You can read it over. But we had to come up with a consistency somewhere. How many of you have gone through the course already? You've received your certification. I know there's some in here. Amen. So we want to have our curriculum to the point where it's the easiest on the eyes. It's the easiest to be entreated. It's the easiest to digest as possible. And we have to keep it as consistent as possible. So from the eyes of the person, the new believer that's going through our courses, we want them to have as least distraction as possible. So we came up with a list of consistencies. I'm not going to go over now. It's in there. There's a link. Go ahead and hit that and read it. We're not teaching Bible studies here, saints. There's a huge difference between a Bible study and curriculum. Let me just put it in layman's terms. A Bible study, a sermon, awesome, great, anointed, can move and change your life, right? But in that particular push of knowledge and, and, and the putting out of knowledge, whether from the pulpit or, or, or whatever it may be, there is no measuring whether you got it. There is no remediation based upon your measuring. There is no mentoring to pull you up. So there's a big difference between curriculum and a sermon or a Bible study. Writing consistency. Theme. Administrated in multiples. Students are introduced. Now this is just the Foundation Cornerstone course. But by the time someone's done, you've been introduced to about a thousand scriptures and definitions. It'll sneak up on you. There's approximately 90, I don't know, 293 lessons in the four chapters of the Cornerstone course. They're all really fast. They're small, yeah, except for a couple. <laughs> but for the most part, they're pretty small, bite-sized pieces. You can probably knock out in about 10 minutes. And it's just like clicking, like a long road trip. The mile markers just click, 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 click. Next thing you know, you're done with that chapter. Yay! I earned my badge to level two. I'm in second chapter. Click, 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 click. I can't stop. I love it. This is so good. I love knowledge. I love the, the way the Holy Spirit just, just treats my mind as I read through the scriptures and I read through this. It's just wonderful. Don't you love it when God reveals something to you? Man, you can't get enough of that. So we move on. That's just the, the, the cornerstone course. Now, I'm not trying to make it look like a big mountain, insurmountable. I'm not. But I do want to be realistic with everyone. We changed systems from an old system to a newer system. The old system was great. It worked. Uh, it outdated itself. It was written in a time when we barely had computers <laughs> and lessons. It, it, and it did its job. It did unity. It, it, it put us all together to teach the same thing. But now... We have adapted, we have adjusted, we have learned as ministry. So why not make that into our curriculum, right? We took a fresh run at it. I'm telling you, we took a fresh run at it. But I'm telling you that there was an anointing. I received the, the, the feedback from people. I received the input from people that were anointed and then when the editing process came in and, and we put it all on the theme, we made it all consistent. The anointing was so strong that there were times that I, I had to back away from my computer and get on my knees and just thank God for the anointing. Because I knew that this is something 
that's going to build our ministry, not just our ministry, but the future salvation of so many people. We've had a lot of people already tell me that they got, that they, they, they seen people get saved because they downloaded one of those lessons or two of those lessons and they, they use it in a small group or taught their family with it. And they ended up getting saved because it was so basic. It was so easy. It was so, so it just led them one point to the next, to the next, to the next. The anointing was strong. So the foundation cornerstone has its own internal communications mechanisms built in. There are feedback forms. There's obvious communications with your mentor. And then there are different levels. Mentors communicate with a mentor coordinator. Uh, there are duty mentors, which is something I'm going to introduce tonight. On our online campus, we have a phone number there. It's a 757 area code number. It's right now listed as technical support. But it's a Skype number. That Skype number rings to whichever cell phone number we put in the system. Think of it as a duty mentor. Those of us in the military, duty. <laughs> Depending on parts of the world, time zones, we could get this to the point where we can be answering people's spiritual questions and we can be tagging people based on which coast they're on in the United States or, or people that are over in Europe. Course manager, that's the person that is responsible for the individual course. Like I said, we got like 20 some different courses up there right now that we're, we're, we're building and we're working on. Course manager is that person that you'll see it on the website. It's one of the links that if you have a question regarding that particular course, you can, you can click that link and it email the course manager for you. There's the director of advancing education who is responsible for the course managers, the curriculum on the website, the duty mentors, the mentor coordinator, all the students giving account, and actually reads the feedback forms. I know that director of education. <laughs> That's me. And then we all give account to the training oversight team, which is the ministry elders and those that they want to appoint into the, the oversight team. But that email right there, AE director at cfcmiae.org, that's me. That goes right to my mailbox. I do, not, I do not spam them. I do read them. So you have this in front of you, those of you that have the paper. You have this in front of you. If you downloaded the PDF, all you have to do is click on it inside the PDF, and it will take you right to the feedback form. There's a training preference form where if you're sharing with somebody or you're for yourself, and you can put a person's name in there, and you can say this person has certain preferences. And here it goes an example. Say they don't have internet at home. So that, that's pretty important to know. They don't have uh, time because they're working crazy hours or, or whatever the case may be. Those are things that need to be understood when we put together the training preference because we're adapting to each need for each person. And you can request a mentor. If you don't have a mentor, you can request. And if you request up here and it comes through that website, I'm going to go through your leaders and we are going to prayerfully determine who a, a good mentor would be. So we've let this ferment and grow for a little while. We're going to be tapping some of you. We're going to be coming and asking whether it's something that you would like to do is to mentor others through this course, through their, their first understandings of a Christian. And we're going to go over that in the second part of this presentation that is called Jesus the Master Mentor. An example for us to follow. I'm going to cover this thought on, uh, on this and then we're going to take a break because I'm losing a couple of you. So the biblical text versions that we're going to be doing here, obviously we have English, but don't forget that there's Spanish, French, Russian, and these are the versions that the curriculum is going to recognize as being the most authentic or the best version available. So all of our curriculum will center around this. We're not going to dance around and use various different Bibles that's in our consistency policy. Why the benefit that could possibly come from that could be lost in the overall feel of unity um, and things of this nature and consistency. I'm not against other versions of paraphrase when it comes to helping somebody understand or whatever, but I don't use them. Uh, preachers get up to the pulpits, right, every Sunday, and, and they, they take a scripture verse and break it down, paraphrase it, right? But their speech is not the word of God. 
It's reference to the Word of God. So, scriptures we use the King James Version if you're speaking English. And then the last slide I want to go into before the break is uh, the nomenclature. We have to have a numbering system. When you start, if you had to start dealing with some of the stuff I'm dealing with, hundreds, hundreds of lessons, <laughs> you better have a system. <laughs> Titles just don't cut it. So, yeah, we have the course letters, our three code, FCS, Foundation Cornerstone. One is referring to the course level or language. Uh, one, two, Spanish, or we could use the ES code after that. Four is the chapter level, and then there's a lesson within the chapter. And then, of course, you got the lesson title, right? Got to have that. So if you were helping someone go through or you look through it, and you're looking for a specific topic, say you're fighting a spiritual battle, but you're only in chapter one, but we have lessons on spiritual battles in chapter four. Either your mentor, your, 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 your elder, your, your pastor, or even through your perusing through the, the learning paths, you can say, I need a lesson on this or that, and you could probably find it. All right? So why don't we all stand? We're going to take a 10-minute break. Welcome back, everybody. All right, we're ready for the second phase here. How about you? All right, so I'm on slide 35. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, that was a jump, wasn't it? Uh, I have about 15 minutes to put this out. <laughs> but the good news is that you have your own copy. We have it online. You can download it. You can study it at your leisure. So what did I say? 35. Okay, turn it. We'll get there. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the tuition. This is something that I have to make clear. Is when we first started our college, and when this is when we were thinking of brick and mortar, I called up the governing body of education. Okay, I called up the government body that, uh, thank you, that if you are an EDU, if you are a college, you offer a degree, you require tuition, you give account to this governing body. Okay. I called that body up and I, and I asked them, do we need to register with you? Do we need to do, do we have to jump any hurdles? Do we have to go any through hoops? Uh, I said, we're not offering any degrees and we're not charging tuition. And they said, sir, you have nothing to talk to with us. They are a governing body. They control the people that offer degrees. They, offer, they, they govern the people that charge for tuition. I don't expect too many people are going to put their certificate of completion up there on the middle of the living room wall around their family, but uh, we don't have to be, we're not required to give account to this for those two reasons. We don't offer degrees. We do not, uh, we do not charge tuition. So if anybody asks you, you know, is it registered? Is this college set up with these people? I called these people and they didn't ever hear about Christian Fellowship Church Ministries International. That's because a long time ago, a gentleman that I have his name uh, told me I didn't need to bother with it because we are not doing the A and B. All right? So I, th I thought I'd make that point just in case anybody tries to say anything about it. Okay, now there's the realistic side. Uh, not for profits, do it all the time. But you want to make sure that you maintain your ethics. Uh, nobody is required to do a donation at all. You don't even see much about it at all. Freely you have received, freely give. That's my understanding of the scripture. But there are certain costs. You know what I mean, you got to have website hosting. You got to. There, there are associated costs that come with that. Our Skype number isn't free either. We have a. a I negotiated with Microsoft. We we got a platform through Microsoft that for two dollars a month you get all Microsoft programs. You get a, a terabyte of online storage. We get all this platform. There's just just I don't know, but 20-some different uh, things that you can do in Microsoft Office 365 platform that I get it for $2 a month. Yes, we do put out a certificate of completion for those that successfully complete. And here's, here's a key point that you really have to get. And that is that in order to receive tracking, the mechanism of our learning management system, the LMS, is our online campus itself, the, the logistics, the back end. It takes about 250,000 files on that web server to run this college, to run this campus. That uh, the only way that we know who you are is if you register as a user, 
and you enroll into that course. The database will not track you, doesn't know who you are if you don't do those two things. So we will not be able to certify that someone has the understanding or has successfully completed unless they are set up as an account and it's free. Nobody's been receiving spam from us, right? I don't, we don't sell this stuff out. We don't do any of that. So feel free to make your own account. Give us your, your email because that could be part of your mentor communication as well if you desire a mentor. File formats. Uh, we have the campus. Okay, the questions that do the measuring to see whether you got the lesson plan. We have uh, various different types of questions. We have multiple choice where there's only one correct answer, and there are multiple choices where there are multiple, more than one possible correct answer. Usually, the way the radio buttons are on the internet and the way that our website, our learning management system handles this is if you see a round circle, they call that a radio button. That button usually is part of a unique answer question. If you see a radio button, a circle, if you see a box, it is usually because you can tick that box with a little check mark and you have multiple potential answers. If it's a unique answer, when you click one answer, it puts that dot in the middle of that circle. If you go to another answer and click it, that dot moves to that answer that you just clicked. It's a unique answer. That's how that works. There's true and false. That's obvious. Fill in the blank. You have a drop down where you can select from words, or there's a fill in the blank where you enter the word and you're graded whether you used the correct word or not. There's matching columns where you set up categories and then different things that fall into those. So those are some of the ways that we can measure. And by the way, we do weight them. We weight them with a running score. That's how we come up whether you got a 70% or not successfully completed. Is by uh, like a multiple, you know, some people go through and just click everything just to try to make sure that they got it. Well, if you do that in our learning management system, I've weighted each one of those potential answers with a positive or negative total. So if you, if you click on that and you do that and you hit one that's not a correct answer, you take away points. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so, okay, I've got to move on. So we already covered what a learning path is. It's the pre-ordered, the lesson. Now, these are the words that the, our learning management system uses. Digital copy is a word I use. Tutor is a word that this management system uses. It's basically someone that we select that has gone through it. Call them a mentor in training, if you will. They're not necessarily classified as a mentor yet because they haven't been trained as a mentor, but yet they do the job of a mentor, which we all do, you know, whether you receive uh, recognition for that or not. A mentor is somebody that has gone through the training, and we have certified them as a mentor. Duty mentor, we talked about mentor coordinator, all these things. Boy, are we going through this, huh? Jesus the Master Mentor. This was a, another seminar that we taught. We use scriptural examples. That's part of the mentor training course. Uh, we're using other books, but for the most part, we're taking what Jesus did to his disciples and what the disciples did in the letters to the church and the Acts of the Apostles, and we're basing our course on that. Okay, mentoring. This is what we're asking of mentors. To assist in the educational and ministerial resources. If somebody's been through it on our, on our course, obviously they know what to do. These are people that are good quality people that help you through this part. Guidance and foundational Christian teachings. Most of them will also be able to get through that because they've been through the basic foundation cornerstone. Admonishing and basing Christian ethics. Now here's a new thing. We've never really done this a lot. We are going to take people that are certified mentors and we're going to say, I want you to help admonish a new person or a person that you're working with, admonish them spiritually. This is where the ministry is taking a growth for over what we used to do. Now, obviously you're going to have to have certain limits, and that's part of the training. You know, what are things that get referred up to the, up the totem pole to the, the, the elders? What are things that you should work with, and what are things that you should not work with? But in basic Christian ethics, that works fine. Uh, encouragement, always encouraging. Never teach in the negative. Never. Positively, no negativity. If you do these things, you should never fall. If we do this, we will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if we do this.